Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of Viva Niche Cage Variety Show. We're from the Niche Cage, the niche-cage.com, where you can read about all sorts of Aotearoa sporting information, lots of football and rugby league at the moment, maybe a sneaky little county, Kiwi County Tour update coming in the next few days as well. We'll see what happens, but you can read about uh, we've got a Warriors deep dive on the website. Flying Kiwis will be there as per usual. Lots of Kiwi NRL information. A lot of stuff you won't be listening to. You can read about it or you can already have re- re- read 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 it on our website, thenews-cage.com. And prior to this, we have recorded our Patreon podcast for the Patreon whānau. You can join the Patreon whānau, patreon.com forward slash our niche, our niche case, E-L niche case today we record our patreon podcast we did drop a couple of thoughts on henry shipley joining the kiwi county tour playing for sussex we also reacted to a all-white squad to face sweden and qatar before diving deep into the new zealand warriors victory over the dolphins so you can uh, have a geese, have a listen to that on our Patreon feed. And Patreon is the best way. It's not the only way, but it is the best way, the easiest way to support the Niche Case straight up the guts. Patreon.com forward slash our Niche Case. You can also sign up to our email newsletter on Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. Monday, what did that mean? It meant a big old Warriors breakdown. So we got... Attacking the Warriors from all angles. You can read about it, deep dive on our website. There were extra stats in the email newsletter. Did spun a yarn for the Patreon feed, and I'll also spin another yarn for the Variety Show. So that's an example of how the Niche Cage can attack Warriors footy from all angles. We are basically attacking like the Warriors. Bit of shape, bit of push, attacking from all angles when analyzing and breaking down winning Warriors footy, of course. Monday also meant big old domestic football rap. Nico the Wildcard had information about the tall ferns, the tall blacks. And there was one other thing. Not yeah, there was. Um, <laughs> but there was something for, uh, that, uh, no, it was the, about the All Whites. And there's Sweden, Sweden had already named their squad. The All Whites hadn't named theirs yet. So I had some stuff on Sweden. And a little bit of specos about the um, about the A Dubs, which is now, I guess now I get to turn that now the squad's out, so I get to turn that into a full length written thing. What do you mean? Came out too late to mention them in this podcast, though. But as you said, we did talk about it in the Patreon, like fresh off the fresh off the press. What's uh, what is specos about the A Dubs? Is that some sort of lingo? Or... <laughs> Speculation about the All Whites. All right, all right, so. That is all there as part of our email news that comes out every Monday and Friday via Substack, the nichecase.substack.com. It's all there for you. We got podcasts, we got the email news that we got the website. You can get all your Kiwi sporting information straight from us, the niche case. We're here for you. And we start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness. And this dose is coming straight from uh Ninth, I think, nineteenth-century poet Walt Whitman, who always has a good quote on him. That fellow, uh, but this particular one, I'm paraphrasing slightly. But truth is whatever satisfies the soul. Truth is whatever satisfies the soul, which is a, a nice one to keep in mind in a in an age where I think the idea, the very concept of truth, is debated, and people like to. Uh, dis- like to base their truths based on their own preconceived ideas and whatever. It's always nice to remember that um, there there is a way to check these things, which is our natural instincts. And we do have, you, know, you can generally tell, you can generally tell what's true and what's real just by like stripping everything back and trusting, trusting nature, I suppose. Truth is, truth is whatever satisfies your soul. There's your, um, there's your lie detector right there. Just takes a bit of work to really understand and and tune into the soul. You got to get through a bit of muck, a bit through a get through a bit of grit and dirt and sludge to really connect with your soul, and then you can um, burst forward. And that's where your happiness comes from. It also reminds me of another one about the soul, uh, which was 
don't have anyone to like credit this to, but I just heard it <laughs> one time. Um, depression is a mutiny of the soul. So if you connect that to what you, your mindfulness, which was, um, truth, truth is whatever satisfies the soul. Truth is whatever satisfies your soul. Depression is a mutiny of the soul. So there's not much happiness there. There's not much satisfaction there. So you might need to get into your, in tune with your uh, soul's truth. How about that? A little bit of mindfulness for you. Connect with your soul. See what happens. All good. Let's crack into some Aotearoa sport. And I'm going to start the show here. Because I'm going to continue this absolute uh, dump of Warriors information after their victory over the Dolphins. They did have a good win over the Dolphins. It was a classic example of Warriors footy under Andrew Webster. Not a whole lot of, um, there were, were a lot, sorry, there were a lot of turnovers deep in the Dolphins' territory, not kicking on the last, turning the ball over deep in their territory, whacking them on defense, making meters. As we've said a few times, the Warriors, they are third for kick return meters in the NRL. So you got Sean's little clock side, you got the back three working hard. Boom, lots of options in attack. Turn the ball over deep in Dolphins territory, whack them again, repeat that process. That was what the Warriors have done all season long. And against the Dolphins team that is highly competitive and they have a lot of mana under Wayne Bennett, the Warriors needed to do that for 60 minutes before they really reap the rewards of that grind. And we've talked a lot about the Warriors grind this season, even in dour situations against the Sharks, the grind paid off. The grind has paid off in two wins over the Cowboys and two wins over the Bulldogs. We saw it again at Mount Smart slash Go Media Stadium. Let's also say biggest crowd of the round was at the Warriors home game in Auckland. How about that? A little bit of Aotearoa Rugby League flavor. Did like, I reckon you're seeing a lot of Sean Johnson celebration. That's great. He's in career best form. Fanoa Blake's in career best form. I reckon Tohu Harris is in career best form. I reckon Marati Nyakore, that was one of his best games for the Warriors. Don't know if it's career best form compared to what he was doing for the Eels, but it's close. Sean's Nickel Klockstad, I think he is in career best form, which is absolutely ridiculous considering what he was doing for the Raiders when they went to a grand final. Now I think he's playing better footy. That is to say, in a game like that, it takes a lot of good players to defeat a, t a team like the Dolphins. I also just want to go down another quick rabbit hole because there was some interesting stuff in New South Wales Cup. Ali Liatau was on fire. He scored two tries in the loss against Rabbitohs. And this is interesting because Rocco Berry, Adam Pompey, Ali Liatawa, Viliami Vailea, they're all young centers. They all played first 15 rugby and they all have a very similar skill set. And I think Liatawa is, is uh, he might be nudging his way up the depth chart, but we'll have to wait and see. Berry out of St. Pat's Silverstream, Pompey out of Tuakau, uh, Wesley College via Tuakau, Liatawa played first 15 for King's College, Vilea played first 15 for Aurere. Liatawa is just as good as those other dudes, I reckon. Lots of competition, lots of depth there. This game against the Rabbitohs in New South Wales Cup also saw Etowati Fukofuka play his first game. He played 23 minutes off the bench, couple of runs and a kick. Couple of runs and a kick for an SG ball player stepping into New South Wales Cup footy. That's what he does. That's what he did all season for SG ball. First game New South Wales Cup. That's what he is doing. Jacob Laban also played as an SG ball player. He played 80 minutes, made a lot of tackles, 31 tackles, one missed tackle. So you've got two dudes from the SG Ball team playing New South Wales Cup this weekend. Let's add a third because the old mate, young mate, Salomiela Halasima, who, Leka Halasima, who is probably at school as we record this, he played his second 80 minute game in a row. He also averaged 11 meters per run, which is uh, rather ridiculous. He averaged 11.8 meters per run. He also made 34 tackles. So 
three SG ball t- dudes playing New South Wales Cup and a Warriors team that is winning in the NRL, playing good footy. Lots of lads in career best zones as well. What's your leading banger from the weekend sporting action? Well, there was an A-League grand final on... Must have been Saturday night. Yeah, it was. It was on Saturday night. It was Melbourne City leading the whole way through the season. Minor premiers, best team in the comp, up against Central Coast Mariners, who probably the second best team in the comp over the course of the whole season. Then really, really funky, really enjoyable team to watch. And they absolutely turned it up in the in the grand final. They won six one over City, which was, you know, significant in and of itself also significant in that this was definitely if the wellington phoenix weren't able to win the a-league this was definitely the next best option from a from a kiwi football perspective because starting fullbacks for central coast mariners on the right side you had storm root on the left side you had james mcgarry and both have had really interesting sort of pathways to get to where they are where like rue came up with the mariners went to a few other clubs had a serious injury at one point, um, got swept up in the the always eligibility stuff at that at that one phase as well, and um, was probably at a point where it was like, is he going to maintain his his thing as a as an A League level player? And then he goes back home to back home, but back to where it started for him at the Central Coast Mariners, and yeah. Yeah, he's now a he's now an A League champion, so that's what's going all right for him. James McGarry was obviously you know it's a he was a bit of a star coming up the Wellington Phoenix Academy. He was one of the standout dudes of his age grade, playing mostly as a striker. Then he doesn't get a first-team contract. Instead, he decides to go to Netherlands, plays for Willems Fay for a year or two, where he played a few times in the top flight in, in, um, in you know, the Dutch Eredivisie. But yeah, mostly sitting on the bench as like a fringe young player. And he was also converted into a left back at that time he had been more of a left wing slash center forward type player converted into a left back returns to the wellington phoenix has a couple years there doesn't quite kick on like he has some nice moments but he doesn't quite you know he doesn't break through in the way that he probably would have hoped he was going to when he went back goes to newcastle has one really good game against the phoenix where he scores a banger for for the jets but Kind of, you know, they shift up their um, they shift up their formation a little bit. They ask it something a little bit different mid-season from their fullbacks. He falls out of favor mid-season transfer to the Central Coast Mariners, and at the Mariners, he's scoring goals, he's setting goals up, he's winning an A League championship. Everything worked out perfectly for him there. It was a it's a great little thing for a dude who's really like he's had some good opportunities and he's either struggled to like kick on or he struggled to just find the right fit at some of those teams. And I think he's got that now at Central Coast, which is awesome. Have to shout out Brian Keltuck as well, Vanuatu's greatest ever footballer probably at this point, who, because, you know, he's not a, he's not a Kiwi baller, but he is a familiar face for several years in the New Zealand domestic scene, winning national leagues with Auckland City and, and whatnot. And um, that is a beautiful sign of the pathway available to the A-League from the... um from you know the New Zealand National League and also that the players who do well at that level can make that step up there are dude because he's not a, he's not like a 19 year old breaking through he's about 28 or 29 or something he's been around the traps and this was really a, an opportunity where it felt like maybe he wouldn't get that maybe there's time like maybe it, it just slipped past him a little bit but nope there he goes straight in and he makes a PFA team of the year absolutely brilliant for Central Coast all season uh would shout out to not part of the grand final squad, but youngster Zach Sorosic, Kiwi fullback, again, made a debut off the bench for them earlier on in the season. He's the son of all Whites legend Chris Sorosic. And Henry Gray, under-20s goalkeeper, did spend some time training with them during the season earlier on. He's since signed with Ipswich Town in the English... I think they got promoted, aren't they? So they got promoted to the English Championship, so second tier there, where he'll probably go into their academy team at first. He was, part, he was a backup for the under-20 World Cup squad. But... Big Kiwi links with the A League champion Central Coast Mariners. There it was it was, as I say, if it wasn't going to be the Wellington Phoenix, this is what this is the result that we wanted. Interesting to know that a couple of examples there, like we're seeing in rugby league, like we're seeing in basketball, you can transi- transition from domestic sport in Aotearoa to performing in at higher levels. Like there is there, and that 
to me, that just proves the quality of sport we do have here in Aotearoa, that you can be, um, that you can make that transition. My next uh, topic here is a weird one, a bit of a weird one. Kaikara France, he lost his UFC fight against Amir Albazi. Kaikara France lost despite um, doubling the striking mahi of his opponent and also nullifying most, if not all, of Albazi's takedown attempts. The takedowns that were successful from Albazi didn't actually lead to anything because Kaikara France, he's got that CKB grappling defense so he can um, handle it. There was a choking attempt that he handled, no worries. Up against the cage, he's fighting the hands, he's getting through his process of do this, do that, work this, work that, then eventually you get out of it. So he was better striking. He handled all of, all of the grappling all good, and he got better as the fight went on. Like his busiest striking rounds were round four, and then that increased to round five. But he lost. Who knows why? But that's all to say the UFC is whack. Like the UFC is just straight up whack. Their scoring system is whack. The uh, the judging is whack because like it it's a everyone has a different opinions on the scoring system. So everyone talking about the fight has different interpretations of the scoring system. Let alone each judge. Let alone each state which hands out the judges to each event let alone like all of that on top of the ufc already being kind of whack but they don't pay the fighters much they've got all this other shit happening their business practices are dubious the leading geezer the front head honcho guy dana white he's a bit of a weirdo the whole ufc is just kind of whack then something like this happens to a kiwi fighter and you're just like yo ufc is just whack what's your other sporting Fit highlight from the weekend well not whack would be the wellington saints all of a sudden who are sneakily working their way up that nbl ladder they had a terrible start to the season they lost their first three in a row but they've actually won four in a row recently they're up to six and five now climbing into the top six after road wins against nelson and taranaki on the weekend who are you know, even away from home, they're probably games that they would have backed themselves to win, but they did. And not only did they win, but they scored 120 points against Nelson. They scored 111 against Taranaki. So big scoring areas from the Saints. That's how they need to win because defensively, we know they're not amazing. But I think they've topped triple figures in like five games out of 11 this year. So they're, they're pretty good. They've also conceded triple figures in three games out of 11. Um, although one of those was against Nelson where they did still win. Kyle Adnam, Australian guard doing fantastic things he's i think he's leading the league in assists he had like a 25 and 16 game in the nelson one another double double with points and assists in the in the second win as well this weekend he's fantastic isaiah Mucius has really helped them with the scoring american import joined a couple games in he's made a big deal um tom vadanovich has been streaky but he's had his moments he certainly had a big game um and uh, I think it was the Nelson game. He was pretty good. And also in that Nelson game, Tori Smith Milner shot five of five from deep. So there you go. Like there's, there's all the ability on this team to turn things around. They've won four games in a row. And if they keep this going, I don't know. They're, they're not going to be a team anyone wants to face. We know what the Saints are like traditionally as a powerhouse in this league. Again, still that streakiness. You can still very much see them playing against the top team and just shooting 20% from deep and 40% from the field and losing. Like, that that could happen. And defensively, big issues. But, you know, Isaiah Leopa should probably back, if it's not this week, the next week. And, yeah, this team is on a roll. They're 6-5. and five. They're fifth. They've actually only got one win. They're actually only now one win behind the Otago Nuggets, suddenly, who were leading things. So it's, it's getting cramped up the top of that, um, the top of that NBL table, I'll tell you what. I wouldn't describe Lydia Ko's LPGA season as whack, but I can see how someone else might think it is whack. Because these are her results this year. Tied 6th, tied 31st, tied 34th, missed the cut, tied 42nd, and then tied 33rd. So she has had five events, and she has finished worse than tied 30th in 
four of the five. So none of that is like overly fantastic, but I think Lydia Ko's just cruising this year. She had a big uh, year last year. She was a dominant force. She had a big off season getting married and just enjoying life. So mad respect to her slow start to this year. I, yeah, I just think she's cruising, but I am curious what happens as she does play a lot more events because her, she played one event in February, two events in March, one event in April, one event in May, one event in June so far in June. So she's not the busiest LPGA golfer, but I'm curious as she settles back into the season, how her, you know, performances look then. You're right. I have got to say that I am excited about the impending Liberato Kakache breakthrough at Empoli in Serie A. It has not come this season. I think you saw like, you know, we saw a bunch of big transfer, like had a couple of massive transfer windows in a row with Kiwi players. And I think we've seen kind of over the past season, a few like uh, unfamiliar hurdles for some of these guys. And Kakache was one of them. Yet like Joe Bell is another who moved to Bromby and was doing okay to start, like to, to finish last season, to start this season. Then yeah, new manager changes things up. He's on the bench watching a lot of games as the season finishes. Um, Marco Stamanich had like six months. Some of that was a uh, winter break, but he had about six months in there where he was barely playing, didn't make a start, only getting a few off the bench after he'd announced that he was going to leave. So it goes. Sapreet Singh had a rotten year with just playing for a terrible team on loan who at first didn't even register him properly. So he missed a couple months because of that. Comes in, couple games in a row. He's getting his goal. He's getting like assists and looking good. He's looking like the creative force he once was. But the team sucked, and very soon that balanced out, and he didn't have another goal or assist after his first five games or something for the rest of the season. Ended it also as an unused sub because they, at the time they finally sacked the manager, um, which sounded like real NRL areas. Like the manager had friends in the boardroom, and they didn't want to sack him because he's their bro and whatever. And he just kept losing games for that reason. And then eventually they brought in a new guy, but it was at the point where they were already going to be relegated. So what's the new guy going to do? He's in to build for next year. He's not going to pick the guy who's on loan who's leaving. So he didn't pick him. Um, even Chris Wood, you know, just two seasons in a row where he's he's done a good, he did a really good job for Newcastle. Always defend what he did for Newcastle, but it wasn't scoring goals. It wasn't being flashy stuff like we're seeing from him in the past. And then as he was starting to get the hang of stuff at Nottingham Forest, he gets injured and misses out. So some of that frustration stuff, Kakache was part of that. In Kakache's case, it was because he was stuck behind a bloke called Fabiano Parisi who last year, second half of the season, had split minutes with. They were alternating starts, but there's a different manager this year, and fair play to Parisi, he was absolutely brilliant. He was so good that he surged into the Italy squad. And if you're being picked as a left back out of Empoli, like that's not Inter Milan, that's not AC Milan, that's not Juventus, that's Empoli. That's as a team fighting to not get relegated. You're doing pretty good to be making Italy squads out of that. And so Kakache just kind of had to deal with a year where he was his backup. He still sprinkled in some appearances along the way. He played 12 games. That's two more than he had last year. He made the same amount of starts, five se- five starts in both seasons. So he's getting he's getting his reps in, working hard in the gym, clearly. He's poked up. Um, but the reason it's exciting is because last two games of the season, Kakache gets both starts. And the reason for that is because, similar to what I was saying about Sapreet Singh, but this is on the other side, Empoli had finally officially avoided relegation. Great little run of form to, to get them into that point late season. And Parisi's leaving. He's under contract, but he's leaving. All season, he's been so good. He's been linked with Inter Milan. He's been linked with Fiorentina. He's been linked with these other clubs. His manager the whole time has been like, yeah, this guy is not going to stay at Empoli. We're, we're selling him. You know, don't worry about it. He's, he's leaving. Kakache's manager has been saying things along the lines when Kakache would get his spare starts because Parisi was suspended or something. Be like, no, this I know he hasn't played a lot, but this is an important player for us. He's a guy we see for the future. It's clear he was backup. He was serving apprenticeship this year. Next year, he's going to be the starter. And, you know, numero uno. And we, as we saw in these two games, like, a lot to get buzzed about. This is a level that he can do some pretty special things and when he starts playing regularly despite how strong Serie A is and you know it's not as strong as it was 20 years ago but it's still one of the top leagues in Europe um these two games we saw I think I think they played Verona and Lazio and we saw from him like solid defense you know 
not getting beaten one on ones. He's holding his position. He's doing good things. He's he's good under pressure. He's moving the ball around. You can't tackle him. You can't press him and dispossess him. He's he can shield it. He can lay it off. He can make move a one two. He can do all these things. He's got energy on the overlaps. Even late in games, he's still pushing forward. Um, crosses into the area. They even had him on set piece duties and and some of the stuff, which was real funny to see. Um, didn't necessarily expect that, but man, he was whipping in some deep balls, perfect little crosses, right? Like eight yards out from goal. Keeper can't come for it. Attacker's getting on there. He should have had an assist from one of them actually in the game before. Next season. Next season, he should be a full-time starter. We'll have to keep an eye on how that Parisi transfer stuff goes. Hopefully that does actually happen, but it all goes to plan. He will be a starting left back in one of the top divisions in Europe. And I'm excited for it, man. I can't wait. I'm excited for the crop of young outside backs sniffing around NRL footy because this weekend we had Junior Ponga make his first appearance for the Roosters. And Ponga is a a player who's been on the radar for Warriors fans for a while. He was a junior Warriors player while he was at Calston Boys High School, Glenora Bears Jr. And he came through the Warriors system very uh, powerful center who didn't quite kick on with the Warriors, went to Wynnum, and then from Wynnum, few seasons in Queensland Cup, he went to the Tigers. He was, it was a bit of a mid, mid-season shift as part of the uh, Michael Maguire takeover, the Kiwi NRL takeover of the Tigers. And then that led to Ponga making a, his NRL debut with the Tigers. And then he was part of a wave of players who joined the Roosters system. And he has been, he basically commanded this opportunity on the wing for the Roosters through New South Wales Cup dominance. He scored a try for the Roosters, had a few errors, but he was pretty solid. Um, His performance reflected the entire Roosters performance. And his form in New South Wales Cup was to the extent that he overtook Jackson Polo, who was a North Coast junior. So that shows that Ponga had dominated New South Wales Cup. He had literally commanded his opportunity. And I found this interesting because the buzz all week was about Valence Tafare. And you would have seen lots of like mainstream media uh, stories about Valence Tafare, cult hero, Valence the house, all this stuff. There's quite a number of Kiwi NRL outside backs who are doing similar things to Valence Tafare, or they have done similar things. Valence Tafare dominated Queensland Cup at centre last year, and Will Warbrick did the same thing. And Will Warbrick is a starting winger for the Melbourne Storm. He's going all right. Dean Mariner was... I'd say over the course of one and a half seasons of Queensland Cup footy, Dean Mariner has been as dominant as Valence Tafare. And he was playing on the wing for the Broncos last week. Keanu Kinney has been as dominant as both of them in a shorter amount of time at fullback for the Burley Bears. He started on at fullback for the Titans. This week in New South Wales Cup, we also had Alfred Smalley from Odahu. He scored a hat-trick for the Bears. The Blacktown Sea Eagles, Manly's New South Wales Cup team, they had Morgan Harper and Jackson Ferris, two Kiwi NRL juniors, centre, wing. They both scored two tries. Let alone Ali Liatawa, who was one of the most dominant centres in New South Wales Cup. There's a lot of these dudes floating around. Be prepared. They're all going to play NRL. Another one for you. Another one is that the Tall Ferns are in Europe right now. They're on a little sneaky tour playing five games, three of them against Serbia, and then also against Turkey and Poland. All of this is in preparation for the Asia Cup, which is happening at the end of the month, where if they finish in the top four at the Asia Cup, which would be their best ever finish, I think they've come fifth before, they've come sixth in the, recently as well, but if they can get top four, make the semifinals, that will keep them into, will put them into olympic qualifiers as well for a chance to make it to the olympics for the first time in quite a while it's been quite a few olympics since the tall ferns last made and i think they might have only actually made it once as well so a lot on the line busy preparation uh they played the first game against serbia and they lost pretty handily it's about 20 odd points in it it's kind of you know that's that's fine. The Serbia, uh, I think they might even be European champions, but they're definitely a top 10 ranked women's basketball team in the world. Really good. 
and the tall ferns aren't that so what are you going to do they got blown out early because serbia were hitting a bunch of threes but strong second half they i think they actually won the second half slightly in in terms of the score in there and they did have some good presence inside they slightly edged the rebounding they got the points in the paint advantage as well so there's some good stuff to build up from there and it is a very young team you look at that squad that they've got 12 players over there um Stella Beck and Panina Davidson both have 50 plus caps, so that's cool. But other than that, the next most experienced player is Charlie Sledger Walker, you know, still at college, um, for one more year before she makes the WNBA. There are eight of the 12 players who came into this tour with single digit games for the Tall Ferns. Four of them debutants, plus I think there might be one or two more who weren't technically debutants, but they were debutants in terms of like caps, um, test matches kind of thing. The equivalent anyway where they had played because they went on a tour friends had a tour of australia earlier it's like start of the year where they played a few aussie club teams so i think they might have counted some of those games um a couple of players who had done that but hadn't played it against another country internationally um and they're missing a couple of players like obviously no mary golding who had a you know, quite a serious car accident recently and good news is that it sounds like she's out of critical condition which is good best wishes to her and the bano for a speedy recovery she actually just come back from an achilles tear as well so you know not not the best luck there but hopefully she's all good um shivana pelvas another experienced player out injured talia tupaya who was the uh the mvp of the tawihi league last year and she was australian at that point she, she was she's an Australian import, played for Australian like under 17s, under 19s, but she has since switched allegiances apparently and she's going to represent the Tall Ferns now. She was going to be on this tour. She got injured as well. Also, Lauren Hippolyte is, I think, with the under 23s, 3x3 for some reason when there's Tall Ferns games on. I don't know how that works, but she'll probably come back in for the Asia Cup. Hopefully, all three of them come back in for the Asia Cup. And the other thing is, I don't actually think Coach Guy Malloy is there because he coaches the Southland Sharks as well. And I'm pretty sure I saw him on TV yesterday for the Sharks-Nuggets game. Um, so I'm not sure if he's actually on the tour either. But, you know, there's some strong assistance. I think they got, like, Leanne Walker as an assistant. And um, um, I think old, uh, um, what's her name, Cameron, isn't it? Jody Cameron is an assistant as well, I think. So there's some there's some plenty of talent there around on the coaching staff as well. But young team, very young team for the Tall Ferns. Just quickly, my last thing is Jordan Ricky. I think he's in a fantastic patch of form. He has helped the Broncos roll through State of Origin, defeating the Warriors and the Sharks. Last two games, he's made 80 tackles with one miss, which going through his season tallies is pretty damn impressive. And also, these are his first two games running over 100 meters. Really important footy from Jordan Ricky with the Brisbane Broncos. What's your last Kiwi Sports note here? My last one is my Flying Kiwis transfer watch list. So we got a few guys. There's always some that we don't know. You can't predict what's going to happen in terms of transfers, things that happen out of the blue. There's young players who haven't stepped up yet. Okay, I'm not counting them. I'm talking about established professionals who I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. And I am going to be keeping a close eye to see what does happen with them. Sapri Singh is one. Finished his loan all his loan stuff has been terrible luck with with Regensburg and beyond so hopefully there's a permanent deal coming up for him or a chance to have another go with the Bayern team I think more likely the former see what happens there Nick Sarnov and Matt Crocombe tied both of them very good seasons in league two could stay at their club Sarnov is under contract but has been linked to Blackburn Rovers Max Crocombe has been offered a new contract but it's been nearly a month and he still hasn't signed it so that sounds like something else keep an eye on that Vic Essen is another one. Football Ferns starting goalkeeper. Had some job sharing duties at Rangers throughout the season. And I just wonder, particularly once she's had an opportunity to play at the World Cup and the spotlight of that, I wonder if you're going to settle for going back to Rangers or maybe, uh, considering they also missed the Champions League, maybe boost that into some kind of uh, bigger, no doubt, a number one opportunity somewhere. Miley Lulaway, likely to be captaining the New Zealand under 17s at the World Cup later this year. He's been released by Manchester City, didn't get this scholarship thing. We'll see what happens there. He's trained with Rangers. He's trialed with uh, Stoke as well. And there was some links with Burnley too. So we'll see how that happens. Um, a lot of those clubs have Manchester City links too, by the way. Callum McCowd has 
failed to get promoted with Helsingor, but had a really good season. Will he go somewhere? Eli just didn't quite crack on in the Super League with Horsens largely because they sucked and they got relegated. So they might meet as opponents in the first division in Denmark. Well, they could both transfer somewhere. I'm at least going to be keeping an eye out. Lots of A-League women's players, but in particular, Claudia Bunge, who was close to a move to England last year, decided one more year in A-League. Is she going to get that English deal following on for the World Cup properly? We shall see. Marco Rojas, I think, is probably going to be released from Colo Colo after the next game, which is a Copa Libertadores game. He'll be a free agent. And then Michael Vaud, stuck at fourth choice at um, at uh, Kyoto Sanga in Japan. He has got to get out of there somehow because you don't want to be a fourth choice goalkeeper. <laughs> Musical jam. I just want to celebrate the uh, Coast Arcade project next to me. Some young folks out of Auckland. They're known as indie pop rock. It sounds like glorious rock and roll from the 90s. Like the era we grew up mm -hmm. with, that type of rock and roll. So lively, lots of variation. Shout out Coast Arcade. Love their... Uh, Love their project. You should all listen to it as well. What's your musical jam? I'll second that Coast Arcade one. I quite like that too. I've heard of a couple of their singles have featured in our album, uh, not album, our um, uh, weekly playlist as well. Um, I'd also check up it's an album by Mega Bog, which was very good. Uh, sort of weirdo, poppy, electronic stuff. Um, definitely with like a post-punky rock edge as well as that's a very very cool album with some wild videos as well i like that one that was in the album jukebox and that is also live the album jukebox with nine albums um between the two of us that we scrambled up little reviews for recommendations check that one out if anyone's interested in our musical tastes that is the variety show for this tuesday we'll be back on thursday with another big niche cast for you Check out the website, thenews-case.com. Tune in, let us know, subscribe, like, however you want to do it, do it. Big up yourself, love yourself, care, car, stay beautiful, cha-cha.